So bear mm -hmm. with me. Welcome everyone. I'm Julie Johnston with Julie J Travel. I craft inspired experiences for active aging travelers, busy professionals and groups seeking exhilarating vacations that envelop you in luxury. With my deep destination knowledge and my access to top guides and my creative spark, I'll make sure that you're completely immersed in the cultures that you travel and the landscapes of the vacations you're taking, along with sprinkling some nice relaxation in there as well. So if you're not already muted, if you would mute yourselves, that would be great. I've started a travel show. It's called Who's Cooking with Julie J. Travel. And each month I'm inviting a guest chef in a different location. And today we're going to Peru and I'm very excited. And we're going to be working with one of my preferred virtuoso travel partners. And that is uh, Peru Empire, an Andean experience company. And our guest chef this morning that we're gonna be starting out with is our executive chef, Maria Faye Garcia. But before we bring her on, I want to start off with a little video. And I'd like to take us to the destination, get us excited about where we're gonna be and the culture and the experience that will be on today's virtual Zoom. So I'm gonna share that with you now. I hope you enjoyed that. And now I'd like to bring Maria Faye on. She's an executive chef. She has 12 years of experience. She came on a little later um, to the culinary scene after her uh, daughter was up and running, so to speak. And she works for uh, the Relay and Chateau Tidilaka and Circa, uh, which is part of the Andean experience and Peru empire. And she believes it's important not to replace the ancient traditions, but to value and use them in her culinary experiences. So I would like to welcome her and I'm going to put her on as the primary speaker for you. So Maria Fe is live in Peru and she's gonna take it away with making uh, a Peruvian ceviche, along with a Pisco Sour, which is your adult beverage. So you can enjoy that uh, later today or this weekend for the holiday. Welcome, Maria. Hello, Julie, and hello, everybody. Welcome to today to this meeting. I'm in Circa, 
Arequipa in Peru uh, in the hotel working, but I took some time off to show you how to make a ceviche. So we get started because I think we have all of us, we have a lot of things to do and we are anxious. So here I have the uh, fish cut, already cut. And I have all my mise en place, like a limo, that I'm going to put into the Maria? fish. Yes, you don't see. We don't see what you're putting it into. We see you and we see your, as you hold it up, but we're not actually seeing it. Yeah, here. There we I go. Some, some limo chili. In Peru, we have a lot of different chilies. And for the ceviche, we use limo that is very nice and other other ones then i'm going to put some cilantro in it no and then i will get some salt because you have to salt and pepper the fish before you put any acid in inside like the lime before that you have to put the everything that will flavor the fish directly. Then you put aside the fish and we are going to make the leche de tigre, which is what is going to flavor um, the, the, the fish later on, no? So we need a little bit of onion. We need uh, celery, then we need a little bit of limo, and we need rocoto paste or chili paste, aioli, no, that you can mix the paste with a little bit of mayonnaise and to get the color. Uh, what else? We need ginger, a little bit of ginger. Then we need lemon. You have the quantities in the recipe, no? Yes, then we do. Then we need fish stock. And I like a little bit of seltzer's water, but only like three tablespoons or something like that. We need salt, pepper. So practically what you are doing with this leche tigre, you are putting all the ingredients that you have with the fish, the remains of the fish inside, and this, you are going to mix it and then uh, put it in the strain and have, we are going to get this juice that is the leche tigre that now I'm going to put in the ceviche, no? I already mixed what I show you. So you put in the ceviche and you mix it. I like to serve the fish very raw. With the lemon, the fish is going to cook, but I don't give that more than five minutes. So we are going to assemble our dish. Here, I said iceberg lettuce, but you really can use any lettuce you like, no? Then the garnish is always sweet potato. So I'm going to put on one side the sweet potato. No, and then corn. Here in Peru, you can use your corn in the States, but here in Peru, we have this white big corn that is really nice. So I'm going to and is part of the garnish. This is the garnish of the ceviche, no?
Now, I'm going to serve the ceviche here. What type of fish are you using again? So, in this, uh, uh, sorry, sea bass in this case. It's nice to have soul or sea bass in Peru, but you know, anywhere in the world, you it has to be a very white, nice, the tender lion of the fish has to be not very small, no, uh, thin. It's nice to have uh, a nice uh, fish, no? Thick and hearty one. Yes. Uh, but in, in uh, uh, I go a lot to, north, uh, to the northeast of the US, and normally I find Sibas, uh, huh? and and it works, and and also so and flounder, and it works. All of them. It has to be. I think the fish for ceviche has to be very fresh. No. Someone is saying they had uh, shrimp ceviche in Peru. Y yes. Yes. It's and I just, my husband and I just got back from Costa Rica and we had lots of ceviche there and we did do it with the sea bass and it was delicious. Yes, it's very, very nice. Normally, and I forgot, but you can, the onion. And, and the sweet potato, you just boil those and then yeah, slice them? Boiled with the sweet potato with a little bit of uh, sugar and salt, no? And, and that's it, it's, it's ready. And I'm going to call Oscar, which is our barman. He's a genius. He won a prize in Peru for, as a barman. He doesn't know. But I'm going to explain the pisco sour and he's going to make us pisco sour here. Yeah, Great. Oscar? Oscarito? I don't think he's here. Yeah. Ben, who was a pisco sour? You tell me, Julie, he, this is Oscar. You can stand up there, Oscar. Uh, you tell me if you see Oscar here. Hello, welcome. This is Oscar. He's our barman. Uh, it's dark on that side, Maria. Yeah. Tienes que venir para acá. Tenemos la luz acá. Yeah, that's that's the better side for light. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to see, to see the table because he's going to work on 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 the surface, no? Entonces, okay. We had a question uh, first before we move on. They're asking how long does it uh, take for the fish to cook in the lemon once the lemon is added before uh, I would eating? Eat it immediately. But if how long? Uh, I would eat it uh, eat it immediately, but between five and ten minutes, no more. Okay. The lime here is very. This is our lime. It's called sutil. And it's very strong and really is not original from Peru, but in Peru, in our lands, it took a special flavor. So I never find a lemon, a lime like this in the world. You have sutil in, 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 in uh, the Middle East and you have, uh, a sutil lemon in many parts of the world, but I don't know why in the north of our country it became this lemon that is really for us, for our food is gold. I, so I it's, love it. it's, it's actually yeah. a lime. It's a lime, not a lemon, correct? Lime. The yeah. lemon is yellow and it's bigger, which I love, but it doesn't cook. So the, the fish, the, the lemon. So when you are in the States, you should buy a lime okay. to cook the yeah. And what the ceviche that I made is not with avocado and maybe also este, uh, olive oil and uh, different things or 
my own issues and I don't know. It's really simple, it's ancient, is um, uh, before the Spaniards get here, the, um, before the Incas, they were cooking ceviche, no? So in, the, uh, in our coast, the Peru, Peru has a very long coast. It's two, um, 3,000 kilometers of coast along oh. the old, it's beautiful, no? So you can find our diversity in fish and seafood is really amazing, no? Uh, so it's, it's very nice because ceviche is one of our dishes. Here in Arequipa, you, you find that crawfish, it's to die for, and they do a ceviche of crawfish that is called celador with not a cooked shrimp, no? The crawfish is not cooked. It's raw and you die, no? And because a crawfish here and, but our culinary thing is very big, no? Around our, everywhere you are going to find different things, no? So when you come to Peru, you have to uh, get a little bit into, into the food and try to, to, to eat regionally, no? Lima is different than Arequipa, Arequipa from Cusco, and like that. And you are welcome to come, and we are going to. So it's a, a definite culinary journey because each region has its own flavors and different uh, fishes and, and different foods that it offers. Um, so traveling there is a delight because you really get a cultural experience that's different in each different region and location. Here comes Oscar, Oscarito, uh, and he will help us. I'm going to tell you what he's doing, but to us, you have a glass there. You are going to put ice in the glass. So it's very cold. It's better to have a cold glass, no? And then Boston, that is, he's going to use a Boston glass to make a cocktail. So he's going also to put ice on it and to have it very cold, no? Then he is going to measure this Pisco, that we use a kind that is called Pisco Quebranta, and in the US you can find Pisco today. Yes, I found some locally here in our New Hampshire uh, liquor store. Oh, which is magnificent. I've yeah, I, I've, made, I've made these before. Uh, last summer when I did a show on Peru on a Facebook Live, they were delicious. Uh-huh, great. So you have three times, you have the recipe there because I sent the recipe, but you have three times pisco, one time syrup that we buy, but I gave you the recipe to make it at home if you like. You have the syrup there. That is our lime, no? That is juice. One time, our lime. Egg white. Less than one time, or I wasn't sure about the egg white, but the drink was absolutely delicious. Uh, no, but the egg white with the line and the movement, it cooks. You know? He's going to add all the water of the ice.
You gotta shake it. Shake, shake, shake. It doesn't go with eyes, so we are off the glass cold. Why are you using the strainer? Because the strainer, maybe with a le uh, lemon, you had something in, or the egg white. Remember the egg white? And here you have um, uh, bitters. So you put some bitter in it. How many drops did you use? Two. Two or three. Dep um, my husband doesn't like bitters. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Here is a little bit early for this. Part. Don't tell anybody. You need to enjoy Cheers. for us. And welcome to Silka whenever you like. Here we expect you. And it's beautiful. It, it is gorgeous there, very sunny. We have one question. Um, a person does not have a shaker, so can they use a liquidizer? I'm not sure what a liquidizer is. I'm, I'm, do you know, do you know you what a liquidizer is? I don't know, but with a mixer, it works perfectly. Now, with a mixer, the ice is going to be, after you mix first, you mix everything first, and then you put the ice and mix it again. Because if not, it's going to be very watery. If you find in the Boston glass, we threw out part, much of the ice. In a mixer, if you leave this mixing for a long time, it's going to come water, which you don't want. No. But or you could even take two glasses that fit inside of each other and create a, a shaker, correct? Yes, but if you go to, to any uh, store, the Boston glass is not very expensive. It's a, something very, uh, I, I don't have a Boston, I don't use a Boston glass. I use a shaker, you know, which instead of the glass here, you have like a, a lid with, so you work with a lead, but anyhow it works. It's like like making. Yeah, so you could use you could use a mason jar yes. as a shaker. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Anything that you could put, a, you know, seal off with the lid or something, would yes. work fine. Yes. Uh huh. We have a lot of we have a lot of mason jars here in the in the Upper Valley in Vermont, New Hampshire areas. Yes. Great. So thank you, have a good time, a good day. Thank you. Any, any additional questions for Maria Faye? Let's all give her a round of applause. Oh, thank here, you so you much. Here. Here. <laughs> yes, I, I can't wait. I, my husband and I were supposed to go two summers ago with a group of uh, advisors. And unfortunately, due to work, we uh, were not able to make it. But Peru is definitely on our short list to come and see you. There's so many adventures and exciting things to do. And so now we're going to learn all about that, a, a sample kind of itinerary. And we're going to be now talking and switching gears. Thank you again, Maria Fay. Appreciate it. And thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. So now we're going to switch gears. And uh, we're going to have 
Sara Guter, and she's going to present a sample itinerary to Peru. And if you have any questions, um, if it's appropriate to interrupt her, I will. If not, we'll just save the questions till the end. And so I'm going to turn it over to her and put her on speaker view. Hi, everybody. How are you? I am actually saying hello from Lima. Um, so unlike Maria Fe in Arequipa, Lima is a little bit cloudier today just because we're heading into the, the more winter months. Um, so I am a little bit jealous that I don't get to, to have a little bit of sun today. Um, but uh, I am going to take you through some of my favorite places to um, what a more classic itinerary would look like um, if you're thinking about coming to Peru and maybe it's your first time. Um, so you know Peru basically as mostly the country that is the home of Machu Picchu, one of the wonders of the world. Maybe this is what uh, can motivate your trip and your desire to come and what, why most people come. There's really a lot that lies um, just below the, the surface, if you will. Um, so really Peru is super, super diverse. So you have the coast, you have the mountainous regions and you have the rainforest. Um, and through this itinerary, you're going to get a little bit of a glimpse of all of these different um, regions in a way, um, especially if it's your first time, I'd say the best way to do it is to keep it down to just one, um, to just these three different locations. So it'd be Lima, um, then moving on to the Sacred Valley, doing Aguascalientes or Machu Picchu. Um, Aguascalientes is actually the town at the base of Machu Picchu. So you're always going to get there um, throughout your journey. Um, that's kind of where you start and where you end your trip to Machu Picchu. Um, and then um, you're going to have um, a few days to kind of relax um, and kind of get to know the actual city of Cusco. So if it, uh, Actually, the Sacred Valley, Aguascalientes, and Cusco are all part of the same region that is also known as Cusco. Um, so if, just so it's not as confusing, we're going to um, divide them into these three different locations. And then Cusco is actually the main city. So starting in Lima, uh, you may know it as the foodie capital. Um, I think it's been pretty much, it's no longer up and coming. I'd say now it's, it's here. It's been established as the foodie capital. Um, but it also has um, a lot of cultural um, things to offer um, and ways that you can kind of see this more modern side of, of Peru. Um, you can see in the center of town, you can see all of the Spanish and colonial buildings um, from when the Spanish um, were here. Um, and you can kind of see the expansion all the way to Barranco, which is a more bohemian neighborhood that actually sits ocean front so you have part of it is the boardwalk you have all of these 1920s 1930s houses that used to be um, the beach houses for the elite of Lima and slowly the city has been growing um, and it has been expanding and you can kind of see all of these different influences that have really shaped what the city is like now and if you want to go even deeper um, into getting to know the culture, you have all of these different museums. You have museums like the Museum of Art of Lima that has that mixture of the pre-Incan, the Incan, um, the more modern art um, works. Um, then you have Museo Largo, which is also um, more focused on the pre-Incan, all the Incan artifacts. You're going to see lots of gold, lo lots of ceramic um, artifacts. And moving on also to the more modern aspect. So you have the Jade Rivera Museum, um, which we actually recommend a lot if you want to learn more about um, the street art. Um, Jade Rivera is a muralist um, that not only has some of his work within the museum, but it's most prevalent outside on out. Um, so in some countries, I'd say like graffiti, but it's all of these beautiful murals that actually teach you more about um, what life is like maybe for some of the people in, in Peru and in Lima and in the outskirts and the towns that are outside as well. Then you can also, you can't leave Lima without eating. So then we have different options that you can also um, 
partake in. So there are the more, more cultural experiences, whether it's cooking with a local chef, uh, whether it's visiting the local markets, you're going to see lots of people who go out daily um, to their markets to find the most fresh produce. You can find the freshest meats, chickens, fish. Um, and at night in the evenings, if, um, if you want to take your hand at maybe a local um, cocktail class, you can learn to make pisco sours. You can also learn how to make chilcanos, which is another beverage that also uses pisco as its main ingredient, a little bit easier. Um, I'd say um, that's if you want to get started somewhere and pisco sour maybe sounds like a little bit more difficult, then chilcanos are also another option. Um, and if you want to take more of the classic approach to eating in Peru, um, you can really eat really well almost anywhere. Um, so you have your world's 50 best restaurants like Central, um, like Maido, like Astrid y Gaston. Um, and you also have these hidden gems that more of the locals frequent. Um, you're going to see lots of fusion um, of different meals whether it's just the classic Peruvian or mixed in with other influences like um, the Asian food or like the, um, the African in, um, influences from um, some of the slaves that did come here during the Spanish, um, the colonial periods. Um, and for, for those of you who are maybe a little bit more adventurous, Lima, there are different ways that you can do it within the city. You can do the, some biking um, through the neighborhoods. You can do some paragliding, um, which actually overlooks the cliffs um, that are along the coast. So it's a really wonderful um, views, especially in the summer. So the summer months here um, in, along the coast are from around December to April. A little bit of May sometimes if we're lucky um, and we can extend all the sun, the sun all the way out there. Um, you can also do sailing and surfing along the Pacific, um, which is actually not to be confused with the Caribbean. It's actually really cold. So even in the summer, keep that in mind. It's not necessarily a beach destination, but you can really enjoy some surfing and some sailing. And if you're willing to go south a little bit outside of, of Lima, um, you can also go off-roading and sandboarding. Um, there are lots of sand dunes kind of more down south um, and up north as well, but down south is closest to Lima and where it honestly doesn't even feel like you're in Lima anymore. Um, we've had some people come in and be like, wow, I felt like I was in the Middle East because I just saw these sand dunes that went on forever. Um, and it, it didn't feel like I was in Lima anymore. So it's something new to try out. Um, and if you maybe didn't think that Lima had it um, had an offer, um, you definitely have options as well. Um, here, um, I'd say you can complement your stay. I'm gonna recommend two different hotels. So first we have Hotel B, um, which is actually in, a, in one of these 1920s casonas, little houses. Um, on the, the Bohemian neighborhood of Barranco. So this hotel has been mostly um, been um, set up around the contemporary, the contemporary art scene um, in Peru. So you're gonna see lots of different artworks by lots of different Peruvian artists all throughout the hotel. So it's a really, a really cool way and it's a really, um, fun experience even just being in the hotel it has a restaurant um, and it's really close to some of the best restaurants in town just walking distance too and for the most uh, the quintessential experience I'd say um, with the wonderful ocean views is the Miraflores Park it's a Belmont hotel so as you can see in the picture um, the sunsets in the summer especially are fantastic um, because all of these windows that you can see um, these are all of the all of the rooms in the hotel. So just imagine waking up and then going to sleep. It is right on the boardwalk. Um, so it's absolutely stunning. Now moving on to the Sacred Valley. This is a, a place that not a lot of people think to visit actually, um, but it is actually a privileged location and the Incas really loved this area. Um, you're going to find, I'd say some of the most famous 
um, sites, Inca sites uh, in this area. And so, so if you stay in the area super close, so you have Morai, um, the terraces, you have Maras, the salt ponds, and then you have Ollantaytambo as well. Um, all are in the sacred valley, but I'd say the most, um, the most stunning part of it is just all of the different landscapes because you actually get to know um, a little bit better the mountainous regions and all of the um, all of the different things that Peru has to offer in this area. You can see all of the different farmlands. You can see all of the creeks, the lakes, the snow-capped mountains. It's just stunning. Um, and the emphasis here in the in terms of gastronomy, I'd say, is. Um, all of the local produce. So I think it, you saw Maria Fe, she used uh, the white corn. So this is the Andean corn, um, just completely different to the, um, the sweet corn that you find in the US. Um, so this is where really you're gonna see a lot of the fields. You're gonna see fields for potatoes. If you didn't know, uh, there are thousands of varieties of potatoes as well. Um, and Peru uh, has been dedicated to researching and finding more about all these different varieties. Um, and then you have quinoa, um, which I think in Peru, we've kind of grown up eating this uh, in savory and sweet dishes. Um, but I feel like now it's getting more of that hype, more of that recognition um, as one of the superfoods, if you will. Um, so a farm to table experience in the Sacred Valley overlooking the, like the, all of the the mountains and the fields is a really great way to go um, and a really great way to learn more about um, the cuisine in this area, in this region. Then for adventure, I'd say this is the area where you can integrate it a little bit better uh, with all of the different visits to different sites. You can go kayaking, you can go paddle boarding, maybe you can bike or horseback ride through the different um, areas of the Sacred Valley through the different sites um, and kind of really make it a day to see everything that the valley has to offer and just kind of integrate all of the different aspects. Um, as you acclimate, because this is also the location because it's lower down to um, than Cusco, um, it really helps you acclimate. And if you're really feeling the adventurous spirit. Um, we also have the Sky Lodge. So the Sky Lodge are these pods that are built uh, cliffside um, that overlook the Sacred Valley. You can kind of see the river below. Um, and the way you get there is you climb these iron ladders uh, and you can have some lunch or you can even spend the night at one of the pods. And then you can zip line right back down, kind of like a bird's eye view of the Sacred Valley. So if you're really feeling the adventurous spirit, <laughs> this is um, a really fun experience. And here uh, you're going to see that a lot of the hotels are mostly um, these hacienda style houses um, that kind of blend in and help you um, become more one, if you will, with the, the landscapes. So you're gonna have lots of these different casitas or little houses where you can stay and it's very um, private at the same time. Um, so you have Inca Terra Machu Picchu Pueblo, which is one of the options that we recommend, um, has different activities that are also included with your stay. So you can, uh, maybe you, are, you got back from a day of sightseeing or of, um, of adventure and you wanna spend some time at the hotel, but you wanna also um, maybe make some um, chicha, which is a local beverage as well, get to learn how to make that, uh, or you want to go on a walk around the property, that's also an option. Um, you also have Soliluna, uh, which is a hotel that actually also has a pool. Um, it's very uh, kitschy in its style of, of decoration, um, and it has two different restaurants on site too. Um, that are very good. Um, it has a horse show um, as well um, during lunch. So it's, it's a wonderful place to stay. And for a more fully inclusive option, you have Explora in the, sacred, in the Sacred Valley. So you have all of the activities, all of your meals that are also included and you get to know more of the Sacred Valley. Now moving on to Machu Picchu, 
um, which is the, I'd say the main event for a lot of people. Uh, then, then the best way to get there is really either by train. Um, so you can take one of the local trains. So just the classic uh, expedition or Vista Dome services um, by Peru Rail, or you also have old fashioned luxury aboard the Hiram Bingham. You can take the train on the way in and have lunch, or you can take the train on the way back and have dinner. Um, usually on the way back, everybody says it's a party. You have so much fun. There are music, uh, uh, there's music on board. And by the time you get either to, to Ollantaytambo in the Sacred Valley or to Cusco, it's, it's basically like you've had two different experiences, one visiting Machu Picchu and the other one along the way as you make your way back or into, this, uh, into Machu Picchu. Um, and then another option that some people consider um, if they're more active, but that um, maybe not a lot of people know about is the Inca Trail. You have two different options. You can either do the long Inca Trail if you have time, where you camp as well, or you can do the short version. So the short version um, is for anybody who's interested and maybe has that um, stamina to actually make it through the hiking for six hours. Um, but it's just one day and then you end at the sun gate, which is uh, the main entrance, the entrance that the Incas used to take. Um, and once you're there, um, so if you can see it on the map, that's the sun gate. And then anybody who takes the, um, the Inca trail will make their way back down to the Machu, the Machu Picchu entrance. Um, and then you can visit the citadel, but you can also opt to do some of the different hikes around the citadel. So you have Machu Picchu Mountain, which is higher up. Um, so it's the highest point. Um, and then overlook the citadel. You can do Huayna Picchu Mountain, um, which is the mountain that everybody sees in the pictures, the classic picture of Machu Picchu that always has a mountain in the background. That's Huayna Picchu. Um, so if you are on Huayna Picchu and then you look down, you're actually going to get a different view than what everybody usually gets and what the pictures usually show you. Um, and then there's also the Inca Bridge. So picking which option is best for you will again depend on your level of activity and what you want to do, um, how much time you have in Machu Picchu. Uh, but um, it's something new to discover that not, maybe not a lot of people actually know about. Um, and where to stay, most of the hotels are actually in the town of Aguascalientes, which as I mentioned is at the base of the mountain. Um, and this is one of uh, my favorite hotels in the area, um, which kind of gives you that glimpse of that point where the mountainous area kind of becomes the rainforest. So you get that jungle feel, um, you get to see the different orchids, there is a, um, a, a rescue project for um, local species as well, um, but then the privileged hotel with the privileged location, if you will, is the Sanctuary Lodge. So this is the only hotel that sits right outside the entrance to Machu Picchu. Um, so if you have one of the terraced rooms, you can see um, Huayna Picchu Mountain from your, from your bedroom. And ending with Cusco, um, Cusco is where you are going to mix kind of the Inca foundations with the Spanish uh, construction and the Spanish influences. You can see it very clearly. Um, um, you can see all the different churches. You can see just the Inca sites and you can see the mixture of both. And um, here is also where you're gonna see lots of different workshops, lots of different artisans. Um, and you can even take your hand at some pottery, uh, some painting, um, maybe buying some souvenirs to take home, um, and also kind of connect with your more spiritual side, uh, whether it's with yoga that you can do in the woods spread outside um, in the outskirts of the city, or maybe visiting with a local shaman. Um, where you can do a payment to the earth ceremony to thank mother earth or the Pachamama as we call it. Uh, and then you can also do some coca leaf uh, readings if you are interested. 
Um, and here um, you also have a different culinary experiences, um, but the one of the perks of being in Cusco and that buildings aren't as high up is that you get these stunning views um, if you want to uh, do maybe have a, a, a cooking class on top of one of the higher buildings, or maybe you want to have special dinners. Um, you can have dinner at a bell tower, you can have dinner at the Museum of, of Pre-Columbian Art, um, and know there are these special locations around the city um, that are more hidden. And for soft adventure, um, you'd have to head more towards the outskirts, but again, there's always options here. Uh, you can go whitewater rafting, you can go hiking, and if you're willing to go a little bit further out um, down um, south, you can go to the Rainbow Mountain Ridge. So I think it is one of the locations that is becoming more and more popular. Um, but then what most people don't know is that it's not just one mountain. So it's not just the mountain that you see in the picture. Um, it's actually a range of different mountains. And while this is one location that is most known, there is also another location that has three smaller mountains um, that has a lot less visitors. So you can uh, enjoy this range and not necessarily with a lot of people too and have these stunning pictures to take home as well. Uh, here we love Palacio Nazarenas, which is also a Belmont hotel. Um, this used to be a convent that has been um, updated. You have the outdoor pool, you have amenities like the spa, um, which we think is perfect for, for kids and for families. Um, and more for couples, we recommend Incaterra La Casona, um, which is an 11th century manor. Um, and it only has 11 rooms, so um, you have more of this uh, private, more intimate feel. And all of these hotels are located in the historic center. So you're basically walking distance to all of the main sites. Uh, you are like right outside, you have the cobblestone streets, um, you have the artisan shops. So it's a wonderful way to really end your trip. But if you have a little bit of extra time and you want to do a bonus extension, um, Maria Fe, I was actually, we were talking earlier, um, and one of the best ways to go through Peru is driving and getting to know all of the, um, all of the landscapes as, as you go on the road. Um, and one of the locations that not a lot of people know about is the Altiplano, which basically means tall, um, but flat. So it's the Andean plateau is where the Andes are at its widest. Um, so here it's not necessarily about seeing the different mountains. It's more about seeing these landscapes like the lakes that are um, along the way, like seeing these rock formations um, and the um, and the vicuñas, which are actually the cousins to the alpacas and the llamas that are so prevalent in the area. Um, so you're going to see kind of this change as you go from the sacred valley where it's all lush and green and these mountainous locations to these more arid colder landscapes and flatter um, plateaus um, which is a really wonderful experience to see that um, diversity that is in Peru and if uh, what we recommend is going from Cusco to Lake Titicaca um, so you can stay at Titilaca um, which is located on a private peninsula. You can see the lake in the background, which sometimes I feel like people get confused and think it's, it's, it's the ocean, um, just because it's the highest uh, and it's a really large uh, lake. Um, it, it's, it's a really peaceful place. So as you end this trip, um, if you want to relax, kind of get to see the a different side of Peru, visit with the local islands. So there are um, villagers who live on these reed islands that they have been maintaining on the lake for generations. Um, so wonderful way to see a different uh, culture within Peru. Um, and you have Arequipa, which, which is where Maria Fe is right now. It's a city that is surrounded um, by, th by volcanoes and it's also called the White City. And it's called the White City because of the material from a quarry that is used to build that was used to build most of the um, the houses in the historic center. And I think a wonderful way of seeing that is Circa, um, 
which is, is you can see like that's basically what most of the city looks like um and it's a wonderful way to end kind of you've been through the the colder places and you get to this uh warmer location which is arequipa which is um has a really wonderful climate right now. Maria Fe is actually looking into this courtyard right now um, as she is with us. Uh, so just to see and be a, maybe be a little bit jealous of what she gets to experience right now. Um, and hopefully we, we want to welcome you soon. Maybe make your way to Titilaca and Circa as well to try some of Maria Fe's wonderful creations um, and visit us in Peru. So yeah, so if anybody has any questions that we can help answer, is Peru open? I see in one of the questions, yes, Peru is open right now. Um, there is a, you only have to travel with a, with a negative PCR or antigen test. Um, and there is no quarantine requirement as of right now. Uh, so they also just open up the Galapagos, which a lot of people like to tack on that um, mm -hmm. to their, you know, travel to Peru. So that's also a nice new option that's open. Yeah. So um, we're we're ready to welcome everybody and <laughs> um, hopefully continue creating more memories and help you um, help you with that as well. That was wonderful. And we definitely are envious of Maria Fe and where mm -hmm. she's located. It's gorgeous. And I love all that stone. So the rooms with the stone and everything, that's such a unique touch. So it's, it's wonderful. And Sara, you did an excellent job. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful overview. And definitely, uh, like I said, Peru is on my short list. So I'm getting super excited <laughs> to go there looking at all this. Yes, definitely. It, it makes me want to travel more too. <laughs> Honestly, um, you just don't realize how much you miss it until you Someone's have to asking if it. it's safe to go now. Um, I'd say overall, um, we are seeing lots of different uh, improvements, um, whether that's in the number of cases overall, vaccinations are also ongoing, maybe a little bit slower than in the US, but it's happening. Um, all of our properties and most of the properties that we recommend um, have good protocols. Um, and we've had, we've had clients visiting too uh, over the past months who've had a wonderful time, um, really haven't had to change much throughout their journeys. Um, and they've all gone home with really wonderful memories. And one of the perks right now, especially, is that there aren't a lot of people. So it's basically like you get Machu Picchu to yourself. You get all of these wonderful locations to yourself. Um, and um, you can go home and be like, I was one of the 100 people per hour that were in Machu Picchu. Like imagine that before it was full of people and now it's just you. Um, we recently saw um, some of the wildlife that is starting to come out a little bit more. So you can spot different um, bears too that are kind of becoming more comfortable um, and going around the area, which is um, I'd say unheard of, especially in the past few years. I have, to, uh, I can tell you something. Uh, I have to travel a lot around Peru because of uh, hotels. So I go to Puno and then to, to Arequipa, I come a lot and to Cusco. And I think during this pandemic is the best time I had in Arequipa or in Puno or in Cusco. Cusco is only for you. This is the time to come. I, I tell all my friends, I have family in Chile. Last, last November, I called them and I said, you have to come back immediately because this is not going to happen again. <laughs> uh, so it's beautiful. I'm very lucky to be now in Arequipa and I wish you all were here, but we have um, tourists now in the hotel from the US that they're spending time here in Arequipa and in Cusco. And they're traveling and they're having a wonderful time. So it's, it's if you don't go to a mall or enter into a bank 
or uh, where you have a lot of people, where you have, there is a problem, you are not going to have any problem. Yeah, I just got back from Costa Rica and, um, you know, everybody really, you're out in a, an area like Peru or Costa Rica, those places are, are fabulous to travel to right now. Um, you know, they're not closed in areas, a lot of open activities you can do, outdoor adventures you can do. Um, and they were really good as I'm sure they are, and you guys can speak to it in Peru with managing and overseeing the, to make sure everybody does feel comfortable, you know? And a lot of the U.S. travelers right now are vaccinated, as in my group that just went, we were all vaccinated. But, you know, in the airports and things like that or, or in stores, you're wearing the masks. And, um, and then in a lot of the towns or some people were wearing masks. So it, it's, it, it felt very comfortable and safe to travel right now. It was a very good experience. And so we were very excited to get back out there and to do it again. And like I said, Peru, in my opinion, is like Costa Rica, it's a, just a great outdoor space so that it, it really is the perfect time, if anything, like you said. And to go there and have such a wonder of the world all to yourself is definitely, definitely <laughs> something, uh, something is, is now's the time, now's the time. And uh, things are loosening up, you know, with the restrictions and, and the protocols. And so it's getting easier to travel. So we wanna thank you. Does anybody have any additional questions um, for either of the ladies? We wanna thank you for your time. And it was a wonderful presentation um, from both of you. And we loved it. Uh, the video will be later. I'll be uh, getting that out within the next day or so. I'll uh, email it to everybody. So they'll have uh, the video and I'll send the recipes again in case you don't have those. And just wanted to let you know uh, that I'll have my next show coming up, which will be June 16th. We're going to be heading to Greece. We're going to be in Athens, Greece live. And we are actually going to do it an hour earlier uh, due to their time difference and needing to, the chef needs to prepare because it's going to be at a hotel and he needs to prepare for service um, where he is and get um, ready for his culinary uh, duties. So we will be on at 11 a.m. on June 16th it's from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And I'll send out that information so you can sign up once I have it available. I'm just waiting for the recipes uh, from the chef uh, that we'll be doing on that date. So thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you, Sara and Maria Fay. We appreciate your time. And it was a wonderful show. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And we welcome you back again in the future. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Bye. See you soon. Yes, I hope sooner than later. <laughs>